this is Tracy's book ultimately, it should probably start with her. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. suddenly it was like, oh, I see now I could start there and like lay the groundwork for what came later. So it was really, I couldn't have written it, I think, at the be I couldn't have written the beginning at the beginning. I had to go all the way through the story before I could write the right beginning for the book. Welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to interview, where our guest today is Tom Parada. And we'll be talking about his latest book, Tracy Flick Can't Win. Now, last October, I read a very early galley of this book. This is what they come out with when they're really early. This is what it looks like. And they sent it to me and they said, do you want to read this? And I said, yes. So I sat outside on the deck behind the house and I was laughing. And my husband kept saying, what are you laughing at? And I go, this book is so funny. It's got timing. It's got great lines. And I was just going on and on and on about this book. And I came in the house and I said, that's it. This is going to be my first book reporter bet son of 2022. And it's not coming out till June. So now I have to hold all my lines that I'm saying about this. So I wrote all these like great lines. I said, just hold them over here because I'm going to need them. I'm going to need to come back to these. So I had not read Election, but somewhere along the way, I heard Tom say that like Trace, uh, uh, Reese Witherspoon was really good in the movie. So I immediately found the movie online on some like obscure channel because I think it's one of those movies that's on 24 7, 365. You can find it somewhere. So I watched the movie, but that wasn't enough for me to prep for this interview. So last week, and I read Election, which was the book that it was, um, the movie was based on. So I feel like I've gone to the school of Tom Parada right now, and I am completely ready, either that or I'm an overachiever, high school overachiever, but I was really just determined to be prepared. So on that well, note, welcome, Tom. Thank you, Carol. That was, a, <laughs> that was some introduction. <laughs> It's really funny because it's after I was like, and now I haven't read the book. I better go back and read the book. But no, but it, it, it sort of works because you want to put the whole thing together because the first book came out in 1998, a very different time. And so as a result, I felt like if I didn't read that and you know put together the movie and put together what's happening now, I really couldn't be having the same kind of conversation. So what prompted you to write another book about Tracy? So I think there were two things. The, the first thing is, Tracy never went away, you know, especially after the movie came out in 1999. Um, you know, she, that character immediately kind of filled a space in the culture and, and people use the, uh, you know, an allusion to Tracy Flick to describe uh, an ambitious, irritating woman. And, and that, um, you know, got attached to Hillary Clinton among other um, women politicians. And I, I just think there weren't a lot of maybe cultural references available to describe female politicians because there just had not been a lot of them. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing to realize this. Um, but until, you know, the 90s, it was, you know, there are very few um, mm -hmm. national politicians who were who were women. And there are very few stories about women politicians. And so I think the culture grabbed onto Tracy and she became a reference and that lasted for maybe 10 years. And then some writers started to rethink her and say, wait a second, why is she, why is this a negative reference? All she is is a, a ambitious girl who tried to get elected president of her high school. You know, she did a few uh, unethical things, but you know, really she's just a kid. And not only that, she's a kid who had, you know, uh, was, you know, seduced by a teacher. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, I think people started to view her through a feminist and Me Too lens and say, Tracy's the hero of, of this story, not the villain, because she had been really seen as a kind of comic villain, mm -hmm. I think, for, for, you know, some of those years. And so the, that combination of Tracy's life in the culture and then I think, you know, very importantly, like the, the Me Too um, movement inspiring a lot of us to look back on experiences in our lives, but also, you know, in my case, stories that I had written to say, did I, did I get that right? Did I do justice to Tracy's experience? And, you know, I felt, you know, some moral weight around, around that. So I went back and read election and I was um, kind of relieved. I felt like mm -hmm. um, Tracy is in one sense defiant about this relationship, but in another sense, you understand like she realized she was in over her head as soon as it 
happened and she she ended it and and i think in a sense she just it was important to her to, to own it and to say this was my idea to start it it was my idea to stop it it happened it's over let me continue with my march to success um you know and that's what young tracy thought and if tracy flick can't win she's older now and the culture has also started to rethink um stories like tracy's and and she is pondering it at the beginning of this book and yep. it goes through the whole book you know that she's trying to make sense of her experience and um, wondering if she got if her interpretation was wrong yeah the book opens with her picking up the paper and reading yet another me too story and she calls out like this one happened that one happened the other one happened and as they're thinking about it her misguided affair what she said was i love this short-lived they kissed and they had sex one time like that's the way she's defining what happened and was that automatically the start of the book was that really where you went into it or did you start someplace else and all of a sudden go whoa whoa whoa, whoa let's pull back and start where it starts uh so this is not the first time this has happened to me um i started the book with uh vito falcone who is uh, tracy's foil in this book he's a former fo a pro football player who went to the school where tracy is now the assistant principal and he's being honored by this new hall of fame and I started with him uh, because I actually thought it was a book about him. And gradually I realized, no, no, Tracy's here too. And slowly it became Tracy's book. I was not sure how to address the um, Me Too part of this story for a long time. And so I, I wrote the whole book and then I had a scene where Tracy kind of confesses to, to someone about her past. And my editor said, you know, it feels kind of abrupt. Um, you know, you haven't addressed it before. And then she also said, you know, and I, uh, just a completely separate note was, this is Tracy's book, ultimately. It should probably start with her. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. suddenly it was like, oh, I see now I could start there and like lay the groundwork for what came later. So it was really, I couldn't have written it, I think, at the be I couldn't have written the beginning at the beginning. I had to go all the way through the story before I could write the right beginning for the book. Yeah, and it just opens, it's like, boy, we're right one cue. You know, and it's all about character and they're really great characters. We've got the, the principal of the school, Jack Weed, <laughs> I really like his name, who's retiring and he's gonna travel the country in an RV. I don't think he'd be leaving this year. The gas prices are too high. He'd probably say, I'm gonna stay another year. You could have done another year of Tracy waiting for this job, <laughs> just if you wrote it like setting now. So there are, going to, there are scenes where he takes this Winnebago out and is practice driving it, practicing parking it, practicing all these things. And I feel like they were so funny, but you also took something that was really big, the Winnebago, and made it into really small parts of just trying to park trying to do is trying to do that. Am I right? Because it's not like we're just getting on the road and going. No, we have to learn to drive first. <laughs> um, you know, I think as soon as I started to imagine this story, um, you know, I, I did, I wanted to describe his Winnebago, you know, and so I started to, you know, just go online and look at pictures and and you know there there's tons of information if you want to buy a Winnebago you can learn a lot you can take tours of them and my first thought was this thing is a nightmare uh, you know this guy is like almost 70 years old <laughs> and this has been his dream but now he's got to actually drive it you know and it just seemed like one of those really uh sobering lessons that life sometimes gives you yeah you want your dream to come true here it is you know now you have to drive the thing and I, you know, I've been stuck on roads behind those things, and all I think is, I am so glad I'm not <laughs> driving that. So I had some, you know, I had some fun with the idea of uh, this guy, you know, just intent on making this dream come true. And it's a, you know, part of it is that it's his wife's dream, mm -hmm. and he feels like he owes her for good, very good reasons, um, and so he's. He's gonna try and make it work. <laughs> try and make it work. We've behind the, behind those people. I remember being out in Colorado one time. My husband goes, "Oh no, oh no, we're flooring it. I'm seeing what's up ahead. We've got to get around them. No, this is not gonna go well going up that mountain. It's not gonna go well." <laughs> and all of a sudden, we're doing like 90 flying down to cut in front of the Winnebago that we're. And it's always these two people that just look like they're putt putting through life. I mean, it's just. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think they accelerate very well. <laughs> we have friends that. Um, 
went on the road. They did America for two years. They were in their forties and they decided to just drive around New America and they were living in Hoboken at the time. And they had this large, like the largest you know, trailer, I have a home trailer that I've ever seen. And I was like, are you parking on like nine streets in Hoboken? Like, what are you doing with this? And she said, driving this around is like terrifying because you've got to make these wide turns and things like that. So you really, you, you captured exactly what it was like being on, you know, a normal street doing this. So then we've got Vic, who's the recovering alcoholic out to make amends. And he's got a, he's recovering from a traumatic brain injury. Oh, and he was the high school football star. Let's just mm -hmm. go there. And he's back in town. And I think everybody knows a Vic from high school. Yeah, Vito. Either Vic was yeah, Vito, really good. Vito is his name. Oh, Vito, Vito. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Vito. It's okay. Vito, Vito. So see, I just didn't read carefully enough. I should have gone back and read <laughs> the first book again. All right. That'll be homework tonight. So Vito is out and he is, um, he's the guy that we all know. There's always some guy that always, high school was his best years. And maybe he had a couple of years someplace else, but his constant reference point is high school. Like it's going back and where he was the big guy. So tell us about Vic and how you said you originally started the book with him and his being honored. So we're from there. Yeah, you know, uh, so I've, I've, I think, written about guys like this before, you know, and, and um, I, I, I think that one of my subjects, over the past, you know, 20 years or so has been, um, you know, masculinity and how it has to redefine itself in the face of, of feminism, you know, and, and I've been very interested in athletes, um, you know, little children, uh, you know, Todd plays on a, a nighttime football league with all these cops, you know, and it's like this secret world where he can like, be the man that he thought he would be rather than the stay-at-home dad that, that he is. Um, but I also have been actually quite um, moved by th these football players who in their 40s um, discover that, that the thing that made them powerful people, rich people, admired people in the world, this, you know, extreme toughness and athletic ability um, has also injured their brains. And I, I just find it, you know, it's a little bit of that to an athlete dying young or something, just this poignancy of somebody who looks like the healthiest guy in the world, but is suddenly has the brain of an old, old man. Um, and it, it just seemed like such a, a, an interesting thing. Like, so the original story was Vito gets invited back to his hometown to be honored. He's struggling with his, um, you know, these neurological symptoms, but he wants to go back and, and relive the glory days. But there are all these people who are waiting there with, with my idea with, with sort of grudges and um, unfinished business because he treated a lot of people really badly. He was allowed to treat people badly and he took advantage of that. And it seemed like such a great emblem of like, the state of masculinity right now in our culture, which is, you know, men have had their way <laughs> for, you know, for all of all of history, it seems like, and and now, you know, there's a sort of a reckoning coming, and and people are confronting us with, you know, the, the sins of our, our gender, and and you know, there's a sense of having to account for that because there's a lot of, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of bad uh, stuff that that you know, men as a collective group have have done, you know, and so I thought it was just such a really, it was like a poignant story about this particular guy, but also a bigger story about like where we are as a culture right now in terms of our attitudes toward masculinity. Yeah, and where we're judging people for what they did 20, 30 years ago when the culture was completely different of women and men, but now it's you can't have this job anymore because of what you said to somebody 20 years ago or 30 years ago, or you had an affair, or you did this, that, the other thing. Very interesting time in the zeitgeist to be figuring out what is going on, what is right, what is wrong. And, you know, it does remind me that in Sky School, there were labels. There were the brainiacs, the jocks, the druggies, the, I could go on and on, the, the nerds, the this, that, the other thing. And you walk into high school cafeteria at lunchtime, and it's crazy about how these labels still apply even now, like you can walk in and you'll know that table, they all think they're great. That table, they're all wearing the same clothes, that table. And 
I think it's kind of really interesting because Tracy in many ways probably just shed the labels that were attached to her. She, like, you know, I'm going to be Miss Get Up and Go was a lot better than just sitting around the table being, I'm cute and flipping my hair around. She was really working to be different. And, but now she's back at this high school and she still feels a little stuck in where she is. Like it's gone full circle back to school. So you're the president, big deal, you know? Am I right on where she is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, she did. It, this is, I think, true for all of us, right? If you say, who did you think, you know, 20 years ago, who did you think you would be? And who are you now? And, and you know, some people maybe can look at that and say, I'm exactly who I wanted to be. Or, But I think a lot of people are like, life had some weird twists and turns and I didn't get the thing I wanted, but I got this other thing that I value. You know, she, she's doing that kind of accounting of, you know, her youthful dreams were really big. She wanted to go into politics. She had like that fire inside of her and she had uh, brains and talent. And um, like a lot of talented young people, she thought she could get to the top and, and um, it didn't work out that way. And she's ended up with a much more ordinary career. It's a good one. She has a PhD. She's an administrator. She owns her own home by any standards. She's okay, except by her own standards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and I think that, uh, you know, anyone who's really ambitious and, and spends a lot of time sort of building themselves up in their mind, and she has a mother who's building her up when she's young. Um, if you don't achieve the thing you wanted to, there's a little bit of, um, shame that, that that comes with that and some depression that comes with that i think and tracy is grappling with with those things while still you know being a, a totally functioning adult i remember going back from my 20th um high school reunion and everybody was really nervous and this one girl did not show up because she couldn't lose all the weight she wanted to lose before going to the reunion and i said i conquered that one i was eight months pregnant <laughs> i said it was really really easy i didn't have to worry about it. that was the last thing i was worried about but it was interesting when we looked around the room and you were seeing who people had become. And a lot of times it's who you become is how you've succeeded in life and a job where you live, your, how your children have succeeded. For a lot of people, that was what it was. And you looked around the room and say, you know, everybody did okay. We all did all right. But there were so many people that were still not content with who they'd become and who they were. And they were the, some of them were the people that you thought really had it all when you were back there in high school. So it's really interesting to see how sort of the evolution happened. So I was thinking of it with her as well is I was here when I go back for 20 years, how do I feel walking in that room? I was the kingpin, you know? Yeah. And, and I think um, some things about Tracy have stayed the same. She's kind of a loner. Mm -hmm. um, she's very focused on her own advancement. On the other hand, um, you know, she understands that she's not going to get the thing that she really wanted. And I think we catch her at an interesting moment in this book where she's maybe open to some new possibilities. But then, you know, this principal job opens up and suddenly she's back where she was in election. Like there's, there's, you know, you see her come to life. It's like, I've got this goal again. And she feels like herself when she's campaigning, when she's mm -hmm. striving to get up that that next rung and and it's a it's a small thing she wants to run a school she wants to have to be the top dog for once because she's you know i think that was election too it's like she deserved it she worked harder than anybody else she had a vision for what she could do and people tried to stop her and sure enough you know obstacles come up it, they're, they're not personal and in tracy flip can't win the way they were in election the teacher really had it out for her now it's more institutional it's sort of like uh, tracy doesn't to these men who are making the decision tracy doesn't look like a leader somehow and they have some other idea about what a leader looks like and and that's a little bit in that title tracy flip can't win it's a little bit like what was applied to hillary clinton too there's just a lot of men who are like um you know i don't like her voice or i don't like her clothes you know and what what that was was some way of saying i don't think a woman should be in charge. <laughs> <laughs> We're not ready for quite yet. Not yet, maybe never. And a lot of guys in the heads, it's maybe never. It's maybe never the woman should be running the school. It's, but we've got somebody else running the school too. We've got Desk Diane, 
which I love. I got Diane right. I didn't get Vito right. But yeah. I got Diane right. <laughs> and anyone who has not a child in school knows Desk Diane. She gets the lunch when the kids forgot. You know, you walk in with the lunch and she hands it to them. She'll make sure they get their sneakers. She has chit chat for the parents. Unless there's a tough Desk Diane, and I've run up against those of forgot his lunch, tomorrow he'll be remembering because he's hungry. He doesn't have his shoes, well, then he'll be working out and whatever. So there's many different desk Dianes that happen there. Um, another will smile and page your child. The other one's going to be like, eh, okay, you're on your own, kid. So what was this desk Diane like? She was always there for everyone, right? Yeah, so, so front desk Diane is, uh, she got her name because there was um, attendance lady Diane as well. There were two Dianes in the front office. So she's front desk Diane. And she's the interesting kind of person. Um, she took a job in her high school two years after she graduated. She spent a couple of years at community college, and now she's like a young woman, you know, at the front desk in her high school. And it's all she's done for her adult life. For 28 years, she has been the front desk person at the high school. And she is known for her friendliness. She smiles and waves at everyone. And it's actually become a problem. She's become a local celebrity because everybody in town knows who she is. 28 years. She's, so there's many, many high school classes. And so she has to like shop at odd hours because she just wants to be left alone. <laughs> you know? And it was just, it was a, you know, I thought the Hall of Fame was just a fun way to think about, um, you know, what celebrity means in a local sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so Vito is still a celebrity because he won a championship, you know, 30 uh you know 25 years ago or something and diane is is a celebrity because everybody knows and likes her mm -hmm. she's just uh you know she she said she stops at red lights and people are yelling front desk diane front desk diane um but you know she also is in middle age and she's got uh you know her her own story and her own um frustrations you know i mean one of the things i i really wanted to do in both election and tracy flip can't win is just talk about the secret lives of all these uh, ordinary people including the high school kids you know i think everybody has has secrets and um you know i think there with diane it's a very big contrast between the sort of friendly face that she presents to the outward world and, and the emotional turmoil within her. Yeah. What's going on inside inside, inside Diane? <laughs> um, you know, I grew up in New Jersey and I think I still live there. And oh, I think you grew you up live? there too. Yeah, I live out yeah. in Warren. I grew up okay. in Bloomfield and Cedar Grove. Like I did that Sopranos move up Bloomfield Avenue thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then I moved out to Warren. And did you draw anything specific about living here like living here um and now you go up to the boston area but was there anything specific about living in new jersey that came up i mean we don't have the tony soprano kind of stuff but you know just what it's like going to school here or is it high school kind of universal well um you know so in in election the the original book you know i i made a fake town called winwood but i said it close to glen ridge because there was this um sexual assault in glen ridge that um was was in the news and and it it seemed like an important backdrop to, to the story um and and that was where i grew i grew up in union county a, a little town called garwood mm -hmm. um and the new town green meadow which is very funny i think i just like green meadow that's i wanted it to kind of evoke nostalgia and you know just just a kind of a kind of uh, idyllic suburb there's actually a green meadow new york which i didn't realize but this is green meadow new jersey a totally fictional town um i i i did try to like th there's a brief period so there's a guy named kyle dorfman who is a uh, like a nerdy kid from that town who uh, developed an app that made him rich and now he's come back to town and he's built this crazy um modernist mcmansion um back on the site where his original home had been and so I, I just do describe like the the houses around it they're just those those small new jersey single family houses uh you know at some point vito's walking around, it's like 
driveway lawn, driveway lawn, driveway lawn, as far as the eye can see, you know. So I think that there is that kind of New Jersey landscape that um, is just deep in me that, that I, you know, I don't, I don't push it too hard, but that, that's there. And I think, um, you know, I try to talk a little bit about how the town is um, changing demographically. Um, you know, back in Vito's day, it had been extremely white and now it's, you know, becoming a little more Asian, a little more Latino, Latino, a little more black. Um, you know, New Jersey is a very ethnically and racially mm -hmm. diverse place. Mm -hmm. Some of the suburbs are lagging behind that, you know, and this is one of those places. Yeah, yeah, and it, it is what's happening. It's certain places are changing. We were in Hoboken last week, which is just like one house after the other. We were in Jersey City in Hoboken. My husband spends a lot more time out in Somerset County and Hunterdon County. He's in, he's just fascinated by these house upon house upon house, and there's never any parking. Like people just circle for hours trying to park. And I'm like, and he's just sitting there like, whoa, it's like a really crazy way to live that I'm gonna spend half my day trying to figure out where to park the car. So, you know, it was very, very interesting. But, you know, it's, I feel like the, um, the town and the high school, it's like, it's its own world. Like you, you're in these little microcosms of places and until you leave to go someplace else, it's the world you know. And it's the only world you know. I know I went to Catholic school. I didn't know anyone was any other religion there for a really long time. I was like, oh, there are other religions. <laughs> oh, the people next to us were Jewish. Okay, that was one family, but Protestants, what do those people do? You know, because everybody went to the same church and did the same things. And I think there's a lot that makes you think also here about what makes a school great. Because at the beginning, Tracy's looking at test scores. How do the teams do? How is robotics doing? And every town gets measured by the same swath. Like when the town, um, what the test scores come out, everyone's like, oh, we were a few points ahead of like Basking Ridge, or we were a few points ahead of blah, blah. And I've sat in meetings where these things were actually discussed. And I thought, what if we were trying to pe make people more empathetic with one another? which is not to be, you know, sort of against each other all day long, trying to be empathetic. And we weren't pushing the other stuff. What would it be like? And I feel like I'm really like altruistic or something at this point. But as I was reading this book, I thought, what if all those kids in the cafeteria were just getting along? What would, what would happen later? Or do we need these pecking orders in order for people to just kind of want to drive to succeed and things like that? Yeah, so I think this is actually a blind spot for Tracy Flick, right? She is a product of that uh, 80s go-getter, highly individualistic culture. I, I know it well, you know, I, it, it, I was more a 70s kid, but when I was in college, I could feel the world change. And there was this sense, you know, like this hippie dream of, of a, a, you know, fair and compassionate world that just fallen apart. And it was like, everybody, you, you go get what, go get yours, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and college became way more competitive. Um, you know, Tracy, grew up without money, her, you know, she had a single mom, they lived, you know, they were renters and, and she, her mom couldn't afford to send her to college. She needed to get a scholarship and she has deeply uh, kind of internalized this idea of meritocracy. Like mm -hmm. I am competing with everyone around me and I have to be the best. And, and I do think, you know, that is a, in some ways it's been a, a great thing for all sorts of, um, talented people who come from, you know, less advantaged backgrounds, like, you know, but it's also been like kind of devastating for the culture as a whole, mm -hmm. you know, um, a lot of people feel, it makes a lot of people feel like, like losers, you know, mm -hmm. makes mm -hmm. few people feel like winners and makes a lot of people feel like losers. And Tracy still has that, you know, she, she's very focused on test scores. She wants I don't even know if she cares that much about how much kids achieve, except as it's a reflection on her and she's mm -hmm. trying to get, mm -hmm. yeah. get ahead. Like it's like a, an SAT score or something for her. And, and I, I, there's actually a scene where she's interviewing for the job and the superintendent kind of calls her out on that. She's like, everything you talk about is about the top kids and the AP classes and the, and the high achievers, you know, and, and really, you know, it's our job to care for all the kids and especially the kids who, who are struggling, you know, and, and um, Tracy kind of, you know, tries, tries to bluster her way through that. But I think it is a, an actual truth about her and it's part of what makes her life, I think, um, feel like a treadmill to her. She's mm -hmm. always, you know, fighting to, she's always in a competition, which is, 
we live in a competitive culture and that's how it feels sometimes. Yeah. I remember one time I went to a school board meeting. They said they wanted to make sure that every kid had their advantage of their own AP class, their own version of the AP class. And it's not just school is run for the set group of kids, but that set group of kids is how your school is defined. How many people go this? I used to have this great line that parents used to say where we're going to college next year. <laughs> it's like, where you're going to college or your kids <laughs> going to college, or you're both going, are you moving to Harvard? Really? And then I always just, I got this line after a while. I say, well, let me know what happens sophomore year because there's so many people that are achieving their parents' dream or the dream they thought they wanted year one and they get there and they're just like, I want to do this. This is, I don't want to live in California going to school. I don't want to live in Texas going to school. This is what I really, and that sort of reckoning comes, you know, that happens as long. But it's, it's really because we've all been charged with, you must achieve, but achieve on what level? What is, what is good? I yeah, well, it's funny, right? Because when I wrote Tracy in, in the 90s, you know, it just seemed comical. Oh, there's this girl and she just wants to, you know, run every club and, and uh, you know, take every AP class. And, and now there are kids who just, you know, Tracy would look like a slacker to them. You know, they're, yeah. <laughs> they're like, you know, starting nonprofits to, you know, uh, feed the, you know, feed the hungry of the world or something, you know, which yeah. good for them, but, but it, it is, uh, you know, we expect an awful lot from yes. young people. Yes. And some people, especially boys, have not completely developed by the time they're 16, 17. Their frontal lobe is not really there till 28. I'm here to attest to that. That's your boys. And it's like, sometimes you're sitting there going, wow, we're expecting an awful lot of pe from people. And I often say to parents, like, they'll say, oh, you know, he's really not doing that well. And I'm like, how tall is he? And they're like, well, he hasn't had his growth spurt yet. And I was like, oh, you think that his brain isn't ready? His brain is more ready than the rest of them? No, it's like sometimes things just take a lot longer. And unfortunately, high school is these four years. And sometimes if you don't get there till second half of junior year, it's like playing catch up. It's just like, you know, that game. So but meanwhile, we've got the high school fall of Hall of Fame, which seems like the last thing school needs. In fact, you know, Tracy feels it's the last thing they need. And it brings together this interesting group of candidates. And I love the way they were sorting them out. But something that glares in this day and age to a student on the committee, Lily Chu, that nobody else is really seeing is it's all male, first, almost nearly all male and white. And it's something that for years was not considered. I mean, it was not anything that anybody would sit there and look at a group of students and say, oh, we only have white kids on this list. We need to make sure we're multi-racial and things like that. And I think that every age of students thinks that they've nailed, you know, changing the world. But this reminds me it's an ongoing process. And the way people, young people are looking at right now of fair and equitable is very different than what fair and equitable was along the way, you know, years ago. Do you agree with me? It's like we're just seeing a new, like they're propelling it along. Oh, sorry. Yes, I was having a little <laughs> cramp in my leg. Um, sorry. Uh, yes, I, I totally agree with you. And and you know, that was one of the ways. And the the I think one of the points of writing a Tracy Flick book twenty five years after election um, was to try and talk about how things remain the same. In some way, as you say, high school is high school. And in other ways, this generation of kids is very different. So Lily is kind of an echo of Tracy. She is um, a child of um, Chinese immigrants. And, you know, she's ambitious academically and she's applying to Ivy League schools. Um, but, you know, she has a, a much more contemporary focus on uh, what fairness is you know tracy was super individualistic she was very focused but also focused on maybe just the unfairness of gender politics mm -hmm. the way that men always got the benefit of the doubt or had a leg up um and so that that's tracy's lens on the world but lily is looking at it through very much like this uh, contemporary lens of um you know what's what is racial fairness? How are people of color treated? Um, what's it like to be in the minority in this town? Um, and so even though she is like a version of Tracy, she and Tracy don't really see eye to eye on this. Um, you know, Lily um, does some research and finds out that there was a black football player who was just as good as Vito. He was um, the wide receiver. Vito was the quarterback. They were this dynamic duo in town. And this guy, Reggie, was every bit as big a star as Vito. 
but his football career was derailed by um, an incident where, where, you know, he was a victim of racism, but then fought back and then was, you know, uh, for a while was charged with a crime, you know, he basically Reggie's life got derailed by racism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Billy is pointing this out and Tracy is just hearing, oh God, not another football player. Yeah. Right. You know, and she's <laughs> kind of oblivious to, um, the, the racial politics that that Lily is is bringing up. And I, I do think sometimes that's, um, you know, I think, and, and you know, Lily also happens to have a non-binary um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, person that, that she's in love with. And, um, you know, so, so Lily defines herself as queer. So again, she just is is very much representative of, of her generation. And, and um, you know, Tracy is representative of, of her generation and you know the limits that come with that mm -hmm. and each woman is trying to do something in her generation that is pushing it forward and that's what you're, you're, you're saying they're looking at as well did you write each character individually and then weave them together or did you write chronologically i, I mostly chronologically you know as i say i wrote the beginning mm -hmm. at the end but but I, I love this form you know because it it allows you it, so the form in both books is um, there are multiple narrators and they um, are sort of testifying to the reader. It's almost like a little oral history. Um, and sometimes they're kind of all talking about the same thing, but sometimes, you know, Tracy will be in a meeting with other people who are all focused on one thing and she's having a reverie about something else. So it has a kind of a collage like effect. Um, it just gives me as a writer, like all sorts of, options at any given moment you know do i intensify the drama and the conflict here or do i kind of slip off into something else and, and i do, do think it creates this um nice air of unpredictability for the reader mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. story is moving along everybody's kind of in the same world but you just never know who the next chapter is coming from and and whether they're going to answer the question you want answered or if they're going to take you off on some tangent and I think it also gives the reader this uh, a lot of responsibility for kind of having a global view of what's going on because you think you know the characters just have their own limited view like like Tracy is you know not paying a lot of attention to what's going on say with the other people in the front office around her like she's just oblivious to some of the uh intrigue that's happening right under her nose it's just not interesting to her you know she's thinking about what she's thinking about and i always love that idea that only the reader really understands what's going on in the story yeah the reader's got control of the whole story the reader sees everything that's going on and you could slip different things into different places but what you do that's really i i found was terrific is you see the characters you know so many times i'm reading i was reading a book a couple of weeks ago my main name was and all the characters were smushed together like i couldn't remember who was who. I was 100 pages in and I was trying to figure out which person this was. Whereas here, it was, I saw the character, I saw who it was gonna be. I didn't know what was gonna come out of their mouth because it was usually something pretty different, but there's also this, this lot of humor, um, including early on when Bridget, one of the teachers comes back and she has changed over the summer. She's had a makeover from this ordinary girl. She's like the ordinary girl who's freshman year and comes back looking hot and, and everybody's turning heads. Well, this teacher's come back and she's wearing, um, uh, attire that could be considered inappropriate and all the men realize this but they realize that Tracy is got to be the one to talk to her about this because it will be not good for any of them to do it and I'm not gonna talk about what it is because it just becomes this one really hugely funny scene when you're writing a scene like that do you get it to hear and then ramp up the funny like do you just sit there and go okay where else can I take this right now because it would just be funny that she's this person, but let's just keep it going of what's going to happen here. Uh, you know, I, I think it, humor in the pieces, I, I, I don't often think like, oh, I want to ramp up the funny. I think if you set up a funny situation, then you can treat it. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think you can, so, you know, it, it just, there's something in the situations are funny. I think that's my job as a comic writer is just to set up funny situations and once they're set up i think you can just let your characters 
play them out, you know, and, and Tracy is, is a good, a good one for this because she herself doesn't have a sense of humor. Right, right. No, they really, I don't think Tracy laughs once or says anything funny. She, you know, and I think it, it I find it kind of touching about her, but it, you know, would probably make her a difficult friend to have mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, because yeah. she's very focused and intense and, um, you know, is just trying to solve the problem in front of her. And I don't think she has the distance or the um, sense of irony that that would, you know, allow you to laugh with her over over a beer, you know. Yeah. Well, and, and somebody else might sit there and go, wait, I'm going to go do this? Why don't you go do this? Why do I have to go do this? But she's not going to do that. She's like, wait, 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 I've got, all right, how am I going to approach this? What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? You know, it's my responsibility now, you know. Yeah, you know, and, and I think I think that, so that's, it's a funny scene because she has to, talk about a very delicate subject with with this other teacher but it also tracy is the person who everybody relies on and she doesn't push back you know i think she is trying to always prove herself to the people around her it wouldn't it would go against her sense of self to say you do it it's your job yeah that yeah. she thinks if I do it and I handle it correctly, everyone will see that I'm the person who gets things done around here. And that's, um, you know, it's just very different from these men who are very casually delegating responsibilities and avoiding trouble. You know, she's the one um, who, who does it because she thinks she has to prove herself over and over again. And I think that's an exhausting position to be in in life. They're more pointing like, yeah, did you see it? Okay, yeah, you saw it too? Okay. I don't know what we're going to do. And it's all that shorthand conversation that I find that, you know, okay, how are we going to handle this? And all of a sudden she's like, well, what's the problem? Like, okay, all right, fine. Back down. Okay. I got it. Got it. What are you going to say? I don't care. I'm going to go figure it out. Do you ever make yourself laugh when you're writing? Do you laugh too? Every now and again. And then I know that it's, it's a, it's a, I, you know, I, I hope that what I laugh at is what you'll laugh at. So uh, yes, every now and then I, I, I do. Um, not as much as when I was younger, for some reason. Oh, go back to laughing. It's really, <laughs> you nail it a lot, a lot. <laughs> so poor Tracy, she, she changed her life plans to take care of her mom. She's, you know, not what election Tracy foresaw at all, but she's doing a good job, everything that she's doing. Um, behind what happens to the job, she's won a lot at life. And I just can't figure out like why she doesn't see a lot of that because she didn't get the big thing. Like there's a lot of little things as well. And she doesn't really see those at all. And even when she's having all these discussions, it's constantly an argument with everybody. It's really like, oh, wait, hold on a second. I still didn't get that. Wait, what am I supposed to be asking for? I feel like every meeting she sits there and says, what should I be getting out of this? And how am I going to get it? And it's got to be exhausting for somebody to do that. I agree. And, and I do think it is one of the problems with ambition itself. You know, and I say that as somebody who you know, I had this ambition from my teenagers. I wanted to be a writer. It's not easy to, to do, you know, and I, um, you know, really applied myself and I made sacrifices. And I think one of the problems with it is it becomes who you are. Mm -hmm. it, it, and so, so at first it's a means to an end. Like I want to accomplish this thing, but if you spend enough time in that mode, um, even when you accomplish that thing, um, it doesn't, you know satisfy you mm -hmm. just who you are is the person who wants more mm -hmm. and, and i do think um that is a, a you know it's just a it can be a very frustrating thing because no matter what you achieve it doesn't feel like enough and that, that obviously means that there's something some void in you you know i think i think i think tracy grew up with a mother who loved her very much dreamed big for her but also expected triumphs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i think that um there's some sense that i you know tracy has uh, like she won't be loved if mm -hmm. she doesn't uh do extraordinary things and and um i think part of this book is tracy in middle age starting to understand that that is coming from inside of her, not from the world. And that that maybe there's a more forgiving way to think of yourself and 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 how you connect with other people and what they like or respect about you. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I knew when, when, I, when I was younger, I wanted to be Barbara Walters. So I figured out she had to get up at four o'clock in the morning and I am not a morning person. I'm much better doing interviews with Tom Parada at two, two o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, this is much more my style. So who knew it took until two years ago or three years ago when we started doing book reporter talks to that exactly what I wanted to be when I was 20. I could start doing now at two o'clock in the afternoon. Who's <laughs> Barbara now, you know, like seriously. So how, if anything, was the writing experience different than on election? I mean, that was earlier in your career. You never know if you're going to finish a book earlier in your career. There are a lot of things that go on. What about this was different too? Oh boy. Well, I mean, the big thing that was different was that it was happening during the pandemic. Mm. Okay. And, and I had started it maybe three years before three months or three months before the lockdown so i had maybe you know 30 pages or something but it was up and running and it was such a such a blessing for me to have this project mm -hmm. um while it's during that period of like real dread and uncertainty um you know i just it felt like normal life to me i'd go up to my office and put in a day's work and then um you know i'd come down and face the news and and you know, worry about my mother who was, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, was in her late eighties and was, you know, stuck inside her house. And I didn't know if I could go visit her cause I didn't want to put her, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So the, the book was this, um, sort of refuge. Um, and, but I also, you know, I'm now, you know, I had a publisher, I had a contract mm -hmm. when I wrote yep. election back in, Night, you know, started writing it back in 1993. Um, I was an unpublished writer, um, and I had just come off a sort of a failed novel project. Um, I wrote a big family novel um, called Lucky Winners that that was getting rejected everywhere while I was writing Election, and in some ways I was writing Election in response to that because that was a big sprawling book and i said i'm gonna write a book that is like short and tight and has like a beginning and an end uh, but i was i was just in a state of real uncertainty and and self-doubt you know and um you know I, I it was fun for me to reread election and just feel like oh my you know in spite of like all that i was you know all the uncertainty in my life at that point I, I felt like there was some real like spirit in that book that i was you know like a youthful kind of energy and and uh it was really you know it's, it's like kind of re-encountering your old self and it, like you know sometimes you look at old pictures of yourself and you go like oh i did not look good you know in 1978 but this was a case where i was like oh i look good in that picture <laughs> sometimes i sit there and go wow i thought i looked bad in 1978 Give me 1978 me now. <laughs> I know, I know that, that, yeah, yeah. So it was like, it was that, it was like a, a, a piece of my past that I was, um, you know, happy to, to re-encounter. Yeah. But, but I, I think I remember writing it being, you know, one of the things I think that allowed me to write Tracy was, you know, understanding, you know, the fear of, of failure and, and, mm -hmm. you know, that sense of, um, you know, gritting your teeth and, and doing it, even if the world was discouraging you. And, and I was, ha you know, I gave her some, you know, problems sleeping and stomach problems like that, that really were my lot at the time because I was under a certain kind of self-imposed stress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you also are coming off of working in television or working on a show, which is an ensemble kind of a thing, which couldn't have happened during the pandemic. I mean, ensemble alone. And, you, you, you were now going back on your own. And a lot of authors that I've spoken with who have worked on these big projects say, oh, wow, now all of a sudden it's me. I'm not just painting the woodwork. I'm not just doing this. It's the whole thing, all shebang is mine. And was it nice, like as much as working on a big project like the HBO show was fabulous to go back to saying, oh, it's all me, it's all me again. Oh yeah, it was, it was, it was actually, a. a a wonderful experience for me because I just before I started Tracy Flick can't win I was the showrunner of, of Mrs. Fletcher and I had been in the writer's room of the leftovers and I was an executive producer on that so I'd spent almost a decade um, in in that world of intense collaboration and I think Mrs. Fletcher was where I hit my limit because 
it's just the opposite. Being a showrunner is almost the opposite of being a novelist because mm -hmm. it, what you have to do is constantly um, relate to other people and collaborate with other people. And, and that, you know, that can be wonderful. You know, I collaborated with some, with some great people, but there was a, just a lot of emotional energy that was directed outward to like managing relationships. And that's not why I became a novelist in the first place. I became a novelist in the first place because I'd like to be alone in a room trying to figure out what the next word is. Um, and so I was, I was pretty exhausted when, when, that, when that ended. And I took a few months off and then I started writing this book and then the pandemic hit. And I just never in my whole life had a period where all I had to do was write. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there was nobody expected anything from me. I wasn't traveling anywhere, you know. Um, and and I really got to experience, you know, that just that pure novelistic solitude. It was just me and this story for, you know, day after day for, you know, a year and a half. Yeah, you, know, you knew the characters, you knew where you wanted to go, you could play with it a little bit more, but it was more like, it's not like, oh my gosh, you got to be on the set later on, there's a problem. There's a problem over there. They're not getting along. He can't be here that day. It's all that stuff. It's just... Yeah, yeah, no, it was so funny because I was actually, sometimes I would feel like a little worried because I just, no one was emailing me, you know, whereas I, when I was doing the show, it was just like, you know, hundreds of emails a day, you know, and I, I was like, you know, I got really uh, adept at using the thumbs up uh, <laughs> emoji. Like, yeah, just yeah. keep going, folks. <laughs> Off carpal tunnel if I answer every email. Let's just thum it up, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's just really, it, and people don't realize, they think, oh, that must be the most fun thing to do. And they don't realize how much sitting around there is or like getting everybody to be corralled into the right place at the right time in the right mood, doing the right thing. Yeah, it's a lot harder than everybody. I've only shot documentaries and that's enough, trust me. Enough. Yeah, no, but this that is it's a funny, it's a funny space, right? Because it's, you know, if you're the writer, it's like your work is done. So now you're just waiting for other people to do things. And so sometimes between, you know, they're setting up a new scene or whatever, there's just hours where you're just kind of hanging around with with these people and, and it can be a lot of fun. Right. But but it's also you've just got to say, this is my whole life. Yeah, yeah, this is what I'm going to be sitting and doing. Yeah, it, it, there are many times where I, they'd say I was working at a fashion magazine. I was at Mademoiselle for a number of years, and they'd say, "Do you want to go on the shoot?" And I was like, "How do they tell you when you're ready to take the shot?" Because those two hours before, boring, <laughs> really boring, really <laughs> boring. You could disappear during that time. So has Reese Witherspoon weighed in on the book? Has she said anything about the book? Yeah, yeah. So Reese Reese really likes the book, and uh, you know, all I'm allowed to say is that there are talks going on um and hopefully you know i'll be able to say something before too long um you know it'd be so great i mean just, i mean it was it was an experiment for me as a writer to return to a character after 25 years and, and i found her you know still there i could still kind of hear her voice and sense what she would be doing and thinking and i think it would just be so amazing to watch an actor who mm -hmm. you know played a teenage version of a character then play a middle-aged version of the same character i can't mm, really think so of a case so where, that, where that's happened so fingers crossed and also what's happened to them during that time same thing as what happened to you as a writer how they became more confident in the way they would present themselves and not that she wasn't confident in the first film but to see like oh, got all these years of experience this is how i know i want to do this and i know it's going to be right i know i can feel it better you know yeah so was this always the title? Uh, no, I started. I started with Hall of Fame. Oh, okay. Because that was the original veto idea. You yeah, know? yeah, 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 yeah. And and then, but then every time I'd say, "Well, it's, it's called Hall of Fame," but Tracy Flick is in it, and I'm like, oh, "I got to just put her name in the title." So then I tried Tracy Flick in the Hall of Fame, and uh, my publisher was like, "Nah, we don't like that." And then you know, I was kind of scouring the book the way you do when you're looking at titles. And there's, there is a moment where Tracy just says, you know, I couldn't win. Right. Wouldn't let me. And I just said, oh, you know, um, you know, Tracy is all about winning, you know, or trying to win. And, and for her to reach that kind of moment where she thinks, you know, maybe I'm not allowed to win, I think, uh, is is this real dilemma and i i won't sp spoil the story for readers but it, it is about tracy you know 
reckoning with this um, dilemma and finding, trying to find a way out of it. Yeah, it's perfect with head down on the desk, arms crossed, I'm giving up. And was this the first cover you saw or did you see a number of different? Um, I think they, they gave me like uh, three or four and I immediately said, this is a great cover. That's right. She's she's the star. She's not going to make it. <laughs> she's not going to stand in that spotlight. It's not going to work. Yeah. No. I I, I really, uh, it, you know, I, I, I love book covers, and and yeah. a good one is is really exciting. Yeah. When these two, it's like you're sitting there going, "Oh, this is fun." Yeah. yeah no, I, I like this new version of yeah. Electra too. Yeah. Oh boy, they pulled those together. So. I know that you like audiobooks. I remember, I remember hearing you talk about that you really like audiobooks. And this one is done with an ensemble cast, which means that there are more than one person playing the roles throughout. Did you have selection in the performers? Did you know what you had? Did you have a vision of this or was this a publisher's vision? Um, they have a producer over at the publisher um, and they would definitely like send me some some names and, uh, you know, I was it's very interesting to see, you know, when they mentioned Lucy Liu, because I think she, um, you know, she seemed right to me. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Just, I think she has a kind of, sometimes like a, a Tracy-like intelligence and toughness, you know, um, she's the kind of a no-nonsense quality about her um, that, that made me feel like, like comfortable with, with that idea. Um, Dennis Boutsakaris does, uh, Jack Weed, he, he, Dennis read um, The Leftovers and mm -hmm. I had discovered him because he read Philip Roth's um, Nemesis, which is a book I really love. And I thought he he has so much humanity in, in his voice and there's a kind of world weariness in it that I really find appealing. And then, um, you know, a lot of the other, uh, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I think a lot of the other people they cast were really interesting to me too. And, and you know, it's not like I, I want, necessarily celebrities because i'm i listen to enough audiobooks to know that like you know it's it's a it's a skill unto itself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody thinks oh that would be really simple it's not it's really not swallow <laughs> we heard that we have to do that part again so did you know did you have the idea of the ensemble cast or did the publisher have the idea of doing more than one voice on this or was it a collaboration idea um you know i think i they they, they presented it i think they um you know, they they really like that idea. I guess you know, a book that has so many narrators just kind of calling out, <laughs> calling right, out. Right. Their, um, but uh, yes, I, I was going to sympathize with what you said about the gulping and stuff. I I read one story on nine inches, and I was like, oh my god, that is hard work. Yes. And, and yes. I think I know. I think I'm a good reader, um, but but you can't make any mistakes. You know. Mm -mm. You know, one of the things, you had different parts in the book, like this is part four is the overwhelming favorite. Did you do the parts at the beginning or did you do those later on? Did you um, section those up? I, I think that I was aware of, of movements in the, in the story. I sometimes would change those titles, but I knew, I knew where they were. I, um, it's, it's funny. I think I had done it in election as well. And so I wanted the books to have um, mm -hmm. a kind of, Echo, uh, but I also I, I like all that that stuff. You know, I I know there are some writers who just don't even have you know chapter numbers. You know, and, and just want it. You know, the the prose to be the prose. But I actually like the breaks. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't know why exactly, but the, I've definitely come to appreciate that. This may be a sign of like shorter reader attention spans. And I tried to read a Faulkner novel recently, and it was like. You, you, there'd be like these eight page chunks of prose, you know, without any even paragraph breaks. And I found it really hard to just yeah. keep following the thread, you know? I will agree with you. I agree with you. When the type's too small or it's something that's just going to be ongoing, ongoing, ongoing without breaks, it's, I don't find a natural break myself. And I find, especially if I'm reading the evening, I want to know where to go, where I can have a natural stop where the author was thinking of stopping as well. I, I agree. Yeah, that, that's, I, I'm uh, reading in bed and I'm starting, my eyes are starting to go and I do want there to be breaks where I can stop and not feel like I was in the middle of a sentence and I nodded off. Oh, there are 23 more pages before I get to that? Not going to work. And that <laughs> James Patterson, a book page and a half, there's something to be said about it every once in a while. There's something to be said. Like, okay, these little short break things are really good. So have you got an idea for a next book or something you're noodling around? Have you started or? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm noodling around. Um, and, and I think to the extent that Tracy Flick can't win is a revisitation of my own past, this thing I'm working on now. Um, you know, my first book is called Bad Haircut, and it's about, you know, working class New Jersey in the 70s. And I'm writing about that world, but Bad Haircut was through the eyes of a, of a kid, you know, looking back on his child. He's like in college, but he's looking back. So he's not a man, but this is now like a, a middle-aged man looking back at the 1970s and, and thinking about um, a particular uh, summer where, where something really important happened. And you know what? It seems like it's so like, oh my gosh, that's so long ago. And somebody said the other day, the difference between, was it 2022 and the 1970s is the same as between um, that in 1918 or something like that. And I was like, oh my gosh, like really? Is that how much? And you think how much of the world has changed since 1978. You think about the world has changed since two years ago. I mean, we wouldn't have been doing this. We would have been in the same room doing the same thing together. And now the world has opened up so much more. You can find things. We have a lot of people that watch these interviews when the book first comes out. We have a lot of people that find this book when they find the book. And there, all of a sudden, this interview is important to them then. And whereas if you've done it in a store, well, that moment's over and you sold the book then. But there's no like, oh, you came into the store. Let me tell you what he said last week. Like, it's not that same kind of moment. And I think that that's something we never really thought about before. And then there's the paperback. And then you're, you put the same thing up. And we put up six interviews the other day of the big six pa paperbacks for June and hear interviews with them. That may be when the person's finding the book. Never had that before. It was due and that was it, you know, over. Yeah, no, and I, I do think, um, you know, somewhere in the last 10 or 15 years, there's just been like a decisive rupture with past human experience, you know, just, just this completely online living mm -hmm. in the sense of people just, you know, kind of their most important companion is this, this, you know, phone in their hand. Mm -hmm. um, and it's changed, you know, our relationships and it's changed our modes of transportation and it's changed our work lot you know it just um so that something like you know it actually is a real problem like like on tv shows of just how to represent what's happening on a phone mm -hmm. yeah how do you see <laughs> these and sometimes they have the words come up and i'm like wait a second i have to see those words were well, those important for me to be reading right now like did i need to and then i'll start rewinding <laughs> to try to get closer to the tv to see what they're saying because i'm like are they expecting me to be reading that? Or am I supposed to just know she's looking at her phone and doing something? It's a very weird experience to be having because I normally never would have worried about that. They would have answered the phone and gone on. Yeah, no, I think it's why a lot of writers are, are setting their stories in the past just because just to avoid like the tyranny of it. But I also think young people who are, that's their native world are gonna do, find ways to tell stories um, that are less clunky in that way, but, but that fully will, you know, use that virtual world as, um, you know, something really central. The backdrop to what's with exactly what's going on. That's where the story is being told. You know, it's funny because sometimes they'll say on, and you will know, be this tragedy that happens on the news at night. And they say, we're looking for this person. You can't even figure out who the person is. And the next day they've got up and this is who it is. And this is his name and we're looking for him. And I'm like, like, wow, those ring cameras, they're everywhere. You, and so as a result, as a writer, it is very hard to get away with things because there's always somebody who's watching. There's always somebody who can get the footage. And many times you're watching on the evening news, the footage is not from the evening news, it's from somebody's ring camera. Of, mm -hmm. And this is how the accident happened. And I'm like, whoa, was that was presented by the Fitzgeralds. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's where it came you know, from. And I think that constant surveillance is actually puts pressure on people's identity too, right? I mean, we would go away to college and you could just say like, I'm this person now and there would be no past for anybody to check, right? They could look at your yearbook picture, but uh, your past was something that you carried inside of you that mm -hmm. did not have a like an objective representation out in the world. But now it's like everybody's just trailed by by their past, you know? Yeah, and, and it's worrisome too, because I was talking to a parent the other day and she was saying that, you know, when the kids come home from school now, if you're being bullied, it used to end when you got off the bus, it was over. And now it's happening on TikTok and it's happening on Instagram and everything. And I think that we've got to have a generation that comes to a reckoning of what's going on. And maybe the next generation is going to do it. I don't know who's going to do it, but to just see what is really happening to people. 
because it's not healthy of what's going on in a lot of levels of it, it, look, it can be a grown up and, you know, to kind of dissuade and like, oh, I don't have to worry about this stuff for kids. Too impressionable. I mean, if you think the cafeteria was tough, try TikTok, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's just something to think about. Well, I had so much fun doing my Tom Barada research, you know, and I mean, do I get an A? Do I get an A? That's all I want to know. <laughs> and you're the class president. <laughs> <laughs> the class president. Nice. Such a pleasure. It's such a pleasure to talk to you, especially since I've been waiting since October to do this. So thank you so much for your time. Good luck on your tour. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you do next. Well, thanks so much, Carol. I really enjoyed it. Great. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks to. 